A young man is killing time at the library when suddenly, out of the corner of his eye, he spots a beautiful girl wandering through the reference section wearing a skimpy bunny girl costume. Not just any girl, though, it's Mai Sakurajima, a famous teenage actress and model who happens to be his senpai in high school. And to make matters stranger, it seems like he's the only person who can see her. To everyone else, she's apparently invisible. If you've seen anime before, this setup and the title of Rascal Does Not Dream of Bunny Girl Senpai are probably going to get the gears in your brain turning, creating expectations of supernatural encounters, etchy indulgences, and as the opening credits introduce yet more girls, harem shenanigans on the horizon. And those expectations wouldn't be wrong, per se. This is a series with a lot of palpable sexual tension, where the protagonist Sakuta has multiple love interests whom he helps deal with supernatural phenomena. But it's also a series written by Hajime Kamoshida, the mind behind the pet girl of Sakura So and last year's brilliant coming-of-age dramedy just because. Kamoshida's a fantastic writer, with a real talent for crafting characters who look quirky and outlandish on paper, yet feel remarkably three-dimensional and down-to-earth on screen. And he's got a real knack for paying off what he sets up in ways that you might not expect, but that still feel fundamentally satisfying and well-earned. Bunny Girl Senpai is not what it first appears to be. If you go in expecting a Monogatari-esque cavalcade of weird anime girls with weirder problems or a metatextual dive into otakudom a la half of all the light novels ever, well, you won't be disappointed, but that's not really what you're going to get. Instead, Bunny Girl Senpai uses its surreal elements to magnify and explore the trials and tribulations of daily life for a modern teenager. And it's fantastic. It feels more real, more authentic to my own experience as a high schooler in the digitally connected age than the vast majority of high school rom-coms in anime, even with its supernatural elements. Actually, they kind of play a big role in making the more realistic elements of the story work as well as they do. The unique hook of Bunny Girl Senpai is puberty syndrome, a supernatural affliction that causes strange phenomena to happen to and around certain kids and teenagers in the show's world, usually when they're under some kind of stress. In-universe, the causes of this syndrome remain unknown, but from an audience perspective, it's clear that each character's unique symptoms correlate in some way to whatever mundane issue issues they're dealing with in real life. For instance, before the start of the series, Sakuta's younger sister was being bullied by her classmates and suddenly cuts started appearing on her body out of nowhere. The emotional pain that she was feeling manifested as direct physical harm. Meanwhile, my senpai, who's gone on an indefinite hiatus as an actress and generally keeps to herself at school in order to stay out of the public eye, begins to literally fade from the public eye as people become incapable of seeing her. On its own, this is kind of a brilliant writing trick for getting us to care about the petty high school drama that dominates these kids' lives and much of the story. The mysteries of the supernatural occurrences that follow each of the show's girls serve as the core of their respective arc storylines. Wanting to uncover answers drives the audience to keep watching, and since each strange phenomena is tied to each girl's character arc, as more of that mystery is revealed, we naturally learn more about them as people as well. That's not to say that the series needs the mystery elements to keep the rom stuff engaging. The dialogue and character writing is plenty strong on its own across the board. Sakuta is a charmingly quick-witted, brash, and smooth protagonist in a field mostly populated by doormats and idiots, while Mai hides a wickedly sharp tongue and playful sense of humor under her prim and proper outward demeanor. Put them together and they've got spellbinding romantic chemistry that makes every scene they're in a delight. But even the best written rom-coms can have difficulty keeping the flirting fun and light while creating sustained dramatic tension. And a story needs tension to keep readers turning pages or keep viewers tuning in week to week. That's what makes us eager to see what will happen next. The looming question of what's causing each case of puberty syndrome keeps the audience guessing and keeps them focused on the characters without having to resort to the contrived misunderstandings that drive many of its romantic contemporaries. Puberty syndrome is more than just a clever way of externalizing the cast's teen angst 
than using it to drive the plot, though. We've already seen a few hints at the broader cause of the syndrome, and I'm not talking about the pseudoscientific misquoting of famously weird thought pieces courtesy of Futaba. No, the real reason that all these strange things are happening, in my opinion, is because of a concept that comes up toward the end of the first arc. Kuki ga Yomenai, often abbreviated as KY, is a common Japanese put-down that roughly translates to you can't read the atmosphere. There's no exact equivalent of this idea in English, but essentially the atmosphere is the general mood of a group, area, or situation. People who don't intuitively grasp this tend to go against the flow of conversation, have trouble taking hints, and do unintentionally awkward things without realizing it. This is far from an exclusively Japanese phenomenon, obviously, but it's a much more significant transgression over there than it is in the West, if you could call it a transgression here at all. Japan is a very non confrontational society, where people generally don't like saying no to one another. So when someone can't tell that they're being awkward, they put others in an uncomfortable bind. Do they put up with the awkwardness, or make themselves even more uncomfortable by confronting it? Neither is a good option, so people who can't read the atmosphere tend to be looked down upon and even made fun of. Which is pretty damn unfair for people who have difficulty picking up on social cues and fitting in, and will just be further frowned upon if they ask what they're doing wrong. Wrong. This invisible social pressure is something that a lot of Japanese media has taken to challenging lately. Early on in Mob Psycho 100, for instance, Mob ends up flying into a 100% rage when Dimple tells him to read the atmosphere, translated as get a clue in the official subs, a phrase that's been used to belittle him all his life. And as the series progresses, Mob's refusal, or inability as the case may be, to act as situations dictate he should serves as both a source of comedy and a surprising solution to many of his biggest problems. The show ends up critiquing this idea that people should all conform to the expectations of those around them. Bunny Girl Senpai takes an even more direct approach to talking about this idea. Puberty syndrome is a physical manifestation of this atmosphere, a metaphor for the social pressures faced by teens. As they grow from kids to adults and it becomes less and less acceptable for them to act out, teens in Bunny Girl Senpai's world come up against this social pressure and are supernaturally forced to conform to it. If I had to place a bet as to how this is happening, I'd guess it's the collective subconscious of those around them exerting some kind of psychokinetic influence. But the metaphysical mechanics of puberty syndrome aren't nearly as interesting to me, at least, as the message behind it. It's a very literal demonstration of the negative effects that society's invisible expectations can have on people. And through it, Kamoshida makes a case for creating the atmosphere you want rather than accepting what's already there. Sakuta describes himself as someone who can read the atmosphere but chooses to ignore it, which makes him a bit of a pariah. His best friend Yuma's girlfriend is constantly telling him to fuck off entirely because she worries that associating with someone so prone to making scenes is diminishing her and Yuma's popularity. She's kind of a huge bitch, and she fails to see the upside of this unconventional mindset. Sakuta is one of the only characters in anime, or fiction, period, who could turn yelling, I'm a virgin, into a crowning moment of badass. And his willingness to buck norms, speak his mind, and go against the grain is what allows him to crack each case of puberty syndrome as it pops up. In my Sakurajima's case, the atmosphere in the school is making everyone look the other way and forget about her because they think she wants to be left alone. And when that spreads to the general population, they start ignoring her as well. As she fades from her celebrity and people begin forgetting about her, in a general sense, it creates a feedback loop in the atmosphere, and they become supernaturally incapable of remembering her at all, to the point that her entire existence is threatened. Sakuta is only able to reverse this when he loudly declares his love for her in front of the entire school, thrusting her back into the spotlight and making it impossible for his classmates to look away from her. In this moment, he uses their tendency to gossip to change the atmosphere to his own ends. This is not unlike the social manipulation Manipulation we see Hachiman perform in Oregairu, except that Sakuta doesn't have a ridiculous martyr complex, so he's able to twist the situation in a way that lets him get what he wants, a date with Mai as well, instead of just pulling the very repetitive and obvious trick of diffusing tension by giving everyone else a common enemy in himself. Man, I could go off on a whole tangent about Oregairu and how this series improves on the other light novels it borrows from, but let's save that for another video. The next, Puberty 
syndrome victim we meet, Tomoe Koga, offers an interesting insight into how the atmosphere can affect people and an interesting point of contrast to Sakuta. Unlike him, she cares a lot about conforming to others' expectations, to the point that when she moved to Yokohama, she reinvented her entire look and personality in order to fit in with the stylish, popular girls in the city. And as is explained at the end of episode 6, she's so attuned to the atmosphere, so good at understanding exactly what every person around her is thinking and wants all at once, that she can use it to accurately simulate the future, which lets her avoid any and all possible outcomes that might interfere with her place in the social hierarchy, and concoct some crazy convoluted plans for controlling the conversation, like her whole fake relationship with Sakuta, which she has planned out down to the breakup. The show makes it clear that this isn't some cliched story of her realizing that she's pretending to be something she's not. Koga is her city girl persona. She's worked hard to cultivate that personality and public image, and she's rightly happy with it. That was something that she wanted and worked to achieve. But, having achieved it, she now bases her every decision on what others might think, and lives her life to evade any possibility of failure rather than confront it, which leaves her stuck, unable to move forward. This is represented, somewhat literally, by her predictions creating a time loop, and Sakuta is only able to break the loop by prompting her to rock the boat a little. Instead of endlessly accommodating him and hoping he'll fall for her eventually, she confronts him with her feelings head on, and she's rejected but she put herself out there and tried, which is what really matters and what she should be proud of. When time resets, she's able to cleanly rebuff the douche nozzle who asked her out in the first loop and accept the possibility that it might put some distance between her and her friends. She's empowered to do this in part because she has Sakuta to fall back on, but mostly because through her ordeal, she's learned the value of speaking her mind and pursuing what she really wants instead of just going with the flow. The individual character character arcs of Bunny Girl Senpai each manage to be really interesting in their own right, and the way that they tie into their respective supernatural phenomena is well thought out. But I think the real beauty of the show only becomes apparent when you look at the bigger picture they paint and see how they all connect with the story's central themes. When you do, you see how this cute, fun love story sends a powerful message about being your own person and creating the world you want to live in. This was also one of the pet girl of Sakura So's biggest strengths. Kamoshida is able to make his characters feel remarkably distinct and fully realized without ever losing sight of what he wants to say. But Sakura So's biggest weakness was a dull plot, and Bunny Girl Senpai fixes that by constructing a supernatural mystery that naturally plays to those strengths. The result is fascinating to analyze in terms of both writing technique and symbolic meaning, and endlessly entertaining to watch. I'm excited both to meet the rest of Bunny Girl Senpai's cast and to see how they affect the show show's atmosphere, and you can rest assured that this video will not be the last thing I have to say about this series. Let me know in the comments below whether you're rooting for Mai or Koga, or Kaide for all of you sick fucks who can't remember Rule D, and while you're down there, don't forget to leave a like if you liked the video, of course, and hit that subscribe button if you want to see more videos like it on June 27th, June 27th, June 27th, and maybe some other days if they ever happen. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.